Today's first reading is a reading from the prophet Isaiah. First, the Lord humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, God will bring glory to to this seaward road, the land west of the Jordan, the district of the Gentiles. Anguish has taken wing, darkness has dispelled. For there will be no more gloom for the land that was in distress. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those who dwelt in the land of gloom, a light has shone. You have brought them abundant joy and great rejoicing. As they rejoice before you, as at the harvest, as people make merry when dividing spoils for the yoke that burdened them, the pole on their shoulder, and the rod of their taskmaster, you have smashed as on the day of Midian. The word of God. Our psalm response this morning is, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my life's refuge. Of whom should I be afraid? The Lord is my light and my salvation. One thing I ask of the Lord, this I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may gaze on the loveliness of the Lord and contemplate God's temple. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I believe that I shall see the bounty of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord with courage. Be stout-hearted and wait for the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The second reading is from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. For it has been reported to me about you, my brothers and sisters, by Chloe's people, that there are rivalries among you. I mean that each of you is saying, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with the wisdom of human eloquence, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its meaning. The word of God. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. That what had been said through the Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali the way to the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sit in darkness have seen a great light. On those dwelling in land overshadowed by death, light has arisen. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the reign of God is at hand. The Gospel of the Lord. No, no. Wait. No, wait. You do this. Oh, I do? Yeah. Just, just carry it on. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there we go. 
As he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. He said to them, come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. He walked along from there and saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. He went around all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel, and curing every disease and illness among people. The gospel of the Lord. Well, good morning. I'm Joel Santora. This is my wife, Megan Santora. This is Millie, Mabel, and Harry. You guys want to say good morning? Good morning. You want to say hi here, son? Hi. Mabel, what do you want to say? Hi, my name is Mabel. I'm five. See, everyone is with you, even God. When I, even when I'm scared, my sister would text me. Okay, thanks, guys. Perfect. Perfect. All right, you guys want to All go right. on the back? I'm, I'm, All right, let me go. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Megan. Mabel has been planning out for about a week what she wants to say. I always say Mabel never met a mic she didn't like. She would be up here the whole time if that was fine with me. Um, so I'm glad everybody's here today and what a beautiful gospel reading that we had. When I think about the miracles that take place in the Bible, I think about things like God, the Son of God being born to a virgin. I think about Jesus turning water into wine or raising the dead, dying himself um, and raising again three days later. And those are big miracles. We, even, today at the end of, or even today at the end of the gospel, we hear Jesus went on proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing all kinds of diseases and illnesses among people. And that's an incredible miracle. Reading this proves to us the power of God, and it helps us instill our faith in him. We read these things, and we really know that with God, all things are possible. But when I read today's passage from Matthew, it's really not the curing of diseases that sticks out to me. I'm struck by the two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John, and really by their ability to say yes. Jesus said to them, leave your jobs and leave your family and come and follow me. And they said, okay. And that miracle is not lost on me. They were not the sons of God. They did not have angels come to them in a dream and say, if you do this, it will all be okay. They were regular people with big faith who said yes. They didn't say to Jesus, I'll go if you prove that it'll work out with me. They didn't say, I'm curious as to how this will look in the next six to 12 months for me in particular. They said, okay, I'll leave my job and my life and I'll follow you and I'll trust that still small voice in myself that each one of us has, that each one of us is called to say yes to. I think about my own life and times that miracles have happened because I've said yes. 13 years ago, I came out of rehab after I hit a bottom with my alcoholism. I was 25 years old. I had no job, no friends, no place to live. I had to move back in with my mom. And I started going to 12-step meetings. I really had no intention of staying sober for the rest of my life. I just thought, I'm scared I'm going to get in more trouble, and I'll just give this a try. A lot of times when I was new in AA, people would say to me, you just have to surrender. They'd say, you fight, you lose, you fight, you lose, you surrender, you win. And that was confusing to me. I thought, how exactly do you surrender? I wanted specific instructions, maybe a workbook, or I wanted multiple choice dittos that was gonna tell me how to feel better. After a couple weeks, I met a sponsor, a woman who agreed to be my sponsor. We met at Starbucks in Brighton, and she said, let's meet here once a week, and I'll read this AA big book to you. And I said, I don't really think that's necessary. I was an English major. I don't really need anybody to read anything to me. <laughs> and she said, that's just what we do here. And I said, OK, I'll try it. She said, there's a meeting on Penfield at 5.30 on Monday nights that needs a coffee maker. And you could sign up for service work, and that will help you stay sober to give back. 
And I said, well, I'm not really much of a coffee drinker. I think I'll pass on that one. I'm really more of a tea girl myself. And she said, that's just what we do here. We do service. And I said, okay, I'll give it a try. And she said, you know, this whole program is based on finding a relationship with a higher power that's going to keep us sober one day at a time. So every morning, I want you to get on your knees and ask God to keep you sober today. And at night, thank him for keeping you sober before you go to bed. And I said, well, that's where I'm going to have to stop you. I'm like, I don't really think that that's for me. I said, you know, I had a great faith as a little girl. And I grew up going to church, but I'm just afraid that I drank through all of that. And I don't really understand how with all of the war and the suffering and bad things in the world, there's going to be a God that's concerned with me to keep me so sober. And she said, Megan, that's just what we do here. And I said, okay, I'll try it. The miracle of saying yes, of saying okay to things that didn't make sense, of taking suggestions even when I thought that I knew better, it changed my life. More miracles started happening. I stopped wanting to drink. I started to fall in love with the fellowship of AA. I became involved in service work and I did the 12 steps and I became a sponsor myself. I met my now husband in AA when I was four years sober and we eventually bought a house and we have three kids. <clears throat> and all because one day at a time I said, okay, yes, I'll try that. You know, like I said before, AA is really based on finding a relationship with a higher power that can keep you sober. It's a spiritual program, it's not religious, and for a few years that worked out fine for me. It was enough for me. But as I had my kids, I started to have this feeling that there could be more for my family <clears throat> in regards to our faith. I wanted my kids to experience learning about God and helping others. I wanted community for our whole family. I started to go back to the parish I was raised in, but something didn't feel right. I was uncomfortable with much of the rhetoric they used there, and really it was something that I was doing because I felt like I had to instead of something that I wanted to. I remember in the fall of 17 when my second child, Mabel, was born, and I was sponsoring a woman named Danielle. Mabel was only a few weeks old, and I was meeting with Danielle, reading the AA Big Book to her, just as my sponsor had done for me. I mentioned to her I want to get Mabel baptized, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it at the church that we had Harrison baptized in, and I just wasn't really sure what I was going to do about that. She mentioned to me that she was going to Spiritus Christi. She specifically told me about Reverend Myra and the love that she felt there. She said she felt so much love even after years of drug use and relapses, and something inside of me said, you should go there. That still, small voice that each one of us had said, go there, go there, go there. And so the next weekend, my mom and Mabel and I came to this 9.30 mass at Hochstein. We walked in, and immediately I felt the energy. I know that you guys know what I'm talking about, like people say today, if you know, you know. The gospel choir sang, He Reigns, and Father Jim prayed out loud from the heart, and my mom and I wept together. About halfway through the service, Mabel was fussing. She needed to be fed and changed, so I took her in the back to try to find a place to change her. I asked a man that I ran into if it was okay if I used one of the rooms to change her diaper, and he said, of course. And then he told me this whole story about when his son was baptized here at Spiritus, and during the Mass, he had this big diaper blowout, and he had to go in the back and change him. And his son had to be baptized in a onesie instead of this special baptism outfit that they bought. I couldn't believe he was talking to me about baptism. I said, that's why I'm here today. This is my first time here, and I want to find a church for our family, and I want to find a place to have Mabel baptized in. And he said, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Mark Potter, and my wife, Siobhan, and I run the Religious Education Program. <laughs> <laughs> he said that includes all the baptism classes and it was a spiritual experience for me I felt God in that moment say this is where you are supposed to be and I have felt that way ever since since then we have become members of Spiritus <clears throat> real members who attend and serve and sign up and show up Shortly after I met Mark and Siobhan, we enrolled our oldest Harrison in the religious ed program. For the past five years, he has grown up here, soaking up all the spiritual principles that this program has to offer. Harrison has learned about serving our community through religious ed in a way that I'm not able to teach him at home when it's just our little family. His religious ed classes have put together bags of hats and gloves and other necessities for the homeless. 
They've made welcome bags for refugees. They talk about what it means to be a part of a community. They learn about God's love for us and his son Jesus and what it means to really serve him. Last year, Mabel was old enough to go to the pre-K program at Religious Ed, but our youngest, Millie, still wasn't old enough, and she had to go to the nursery. Millie was not used to being separated from Mabel, and she would spend the whole nursery crying, not for me, but for her sister, Mabel. The nursery volunteers would walk Millie down to visit her sister, and one time, Mabel's teacher, Miss Megan, said, well, she can stay today. Millie can stay and be with her sister. And after a couple weeks, Millie was a one-year-old, a part of the three and four pre-K program. I really learned that if you want to feel a part of, you have to actually be here. We went to the ice cream meetups in the summer, the fundraiser at Radio Social, and the coffee hours. I saw how the values being taught to my kids impacted the conversations we had at home in their day -to and their day-to-day -day relationships. Their absolute favorite week of the summer is the second week in July, which is Vacation Bible School. This is a week in the summer when Siobhan doesn't sleep and instead focuses all of her time and love and attention on themes and songs and Bible stories and crafts and food trucks. And this year, she somehow even got Reverend Myra to dress up in a hot dog costume, <laughs> which I have pictures of. I'll never forget the first year my kids went, and on the last day when it was time to say goodbye, Harrison went up to Siobhan to give her a hug, and after a couple of seconds, Siobhan and I looked at each other and we realized he was crying, and he said, I just don't want it to end. And I said, don't worry, you can come back next year. He said, a year? You're making me wait a year? Life can be hard and busy, and so many times I get caught up in what's God's will for me. Is God's will for me to go left, or is it to go right? But really what that still small voice in me says is that God wants me to say yes to him. God wants me to answer the phone when someone new from AA is calling, even if I don't feel like chatting. God wants me to vote in local elections, even if I don't always feel like it'll make a difference. God wants me to read an extra bedtime story to my kids, even when I'm exhausted. God wants me to say a prayer and give an extra dollar and tell the people all of the great things that I think about them. So, Spiritus Christi, let me tell you what I think about you. You have changed my life, and you have changed my family's life. This religious ed program, in every single part of this church, has showed me what my true self has believed all along, and what we're now teaching our family, that when you trust God and help others, and say yes, yes, yes to him, that great things will come. Thank you. Break every chain. Oh, oh. So break every chain. Break every 
every change. There's an army rising up, yes. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up, yeah. Break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain.